Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to today's last panel on stage one that concerns the topics of human rights, democracy, participation and sustainability, trying to match those two ends that we usually don't connect well together in these difficult times. If you have a good look at the name of the, our panel, the nickname or the, or the starting is through participation of all. And that, po that points out also to the fact that participation was the main priority of the past uh, Czech presidency of the United Nations Economic and Social Council. So this is also something, uh, unfortunately, our panel cannot take place at the Czernin Palace and we are now in the virtual with this virtual zone. But uh, I think that it's still very important, and this is also the goal of the conference as a whole, to connect to, to practitioners, to connect to politics, and to have some impact, so to way, and to, to um, generate discussions about the, the foreign policy of the Czech Republic and of the EU at uh, large. So to do that, I have two uh, distinguished guests. Uh, that are an academic and a practitioner. I start with uh, Case Bicard from the Institute of Social Studies in The Hague. And he's an associate professor and, uh, and also the head of the uh, center that dedicates to uh, the studies of uh, civil society. So we're to the, we're to the point of uh, this uh, panel. On the other hand, we also have uh, a practitioner from the civil society itself. This is Martin Stransky. He is the, uh, the co-founder and uh, chair of the association and also the head of the uh, Support for Civil Society Center with Arnica, which is a, uh, one of, uh, of, uh, of leading uh, Czech NGOs active in the environment. And Arnica also leads projects um, with civil society throughout the Balkans, uh, Eastern Europe, and beyond. So uh, we have, we can, I hope we'll have this uh, nice conversation, academic and practitioner side. And I also hope that you will, with your questions, those who are watching us uh, from your homes and offices, you can always ask uh, questions to our panelists or suppose any comments using the little slider window that you should see under the uh, the, the screening. So without uh, further ado, I would now uh, pass, uh, uh, give the floor, the virtual floor to, to Case for his presentation about uh, the challenges to uh, participation that we encounter nowadays and some interesting finding from his re recent research. Okay, very good. Let me briefly introduce myself. Yes, I, I work at the Institute of Social Studies um, in The Hague in the Netherlands, which is um, an international institute dedicated to development studies, where most staff and most students come from the global south. So a very special institution. We have occasional European, uh, North American uh, students uh, as well. We have a few from the Czech Republic, and I remember a few. and. Um, I, I really hope one of them is watching today as well. Um, my work has been focusing uh, largely on Latin America, um, but lately also other regions of the world in the themes of civil society, social movements. Um, in recent years, I've worked on multi-stakeholder dialogues, and I'm going to say a few things about that uh, later on. Um, so um, thank you for inviting me. To, to begin with, and uh, I have a short sort of uh, space to share sort of some of my uh, work. So maybe we can get my presentation on, um, which is titled Leaving No One Behind, which is sort of the big theme also uh, of this uh, conference uh, related to the sustainable uh, development goals. And I've, I've been involved in looking um, at uh, how civil society has been participating in the implementation of the SDGs uh, and the agenda, agenda 2030. So before that, I would like to sort of give a brief context. So if I can have the next slide, please. 
Um, yes, and you can click this picture um, is just before uh, the COVID lockdown started in the Netherlands. And it's a, it's, a, it's a picture of Extinction Rebellion activists blocking a street in the middle of Amsterdam. Um, and and the, the sign says, uh, I'm sorry for the disturbances, but we are blocking the road for life. And um, I, I wanted to show you this because um, what, what the pandemic has done, and that's sort of the, con the context of participation, what the pandemic has done, is actually bringing a sudden end to a lot of public protests that we have seen worldwide uh, last year, uh, but also in the beginning of this year. Uh, and that was, uh, I mean, wherever you were and on a whole range of themes, social movement mobilizations uh, were massive uh, worldwide. And the lockdown, of course, put an end to a lot of these public protests what is not to say that social movements manage to connect and to mobilize online uh, and actually also achieved a lot there. And we can talk about that later on. So that I want to highlight that as one important sort of uh, contextual factor. The second one, if we are talking about climate change and uh, uh, the, uh, the, the Paris Agreement, one big aspect is that populist, especially neo-populist regimes uh, have managed to sort of, uh, yeah, to, to deny, undermine um, uh, a lot what is happening uh, and what is stipulated in the Paris Climate Agreement. Um, whereas others have sort of said COVID is a moment to take action uh, and actually COVID is making clear and the, 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 the profoundness of the crisis also makes clear that something dramatic has to change uh, in terms of consumption, in terms of our economies, uh, etc. We can talk about that later as well. And a third element um, uh, that I think is, con is an important contextual element for now is that we see that governments are constraining participation uh, of civil society groups by censorship, by controlling funding, um, making actually um, civic space activity very vulnerable. And I'm going to elaborate a little bit more on that third point. Next slide, please. And that slide shows you uh, the world uh, according to Civicus. Civicus is a worldwide uh, network of civil society organizations, and they've drawn up this principle uh, of uh, civic space openness and closeness. So it is like a, a traffic light of five colors, from green to a completely open civic space, to red, um, uh, which is a, is a closed civic space where very uh, little of these main sort of civic rights can, can be implemented, uh, freedom of expression, uh, freedom uh, of association uh, and uh, uh, freedom to uh, to mobilize. And um, uh, we see also that Europe is not completely uh, green either, uh, nor are other parts. This map, by the way, is changing every day. So the colors are changing. We can have a whole discussion about it. But what is important here is um, that civic space uh, has been shrinking for many civil society groups uh, also over the past couple of months. So let's focus on this role of uh, SDG implementation and what civil societies have done. Uh, next point, please. Because you could ag identify sort of traditionally about five of these uh, practices that uh, civil society organizations have done. First of all, uh, providing information about NGGs, raise, raising awareness. Uh, the next point um, is that civil society organizations have pushed their governments to uh, change policies uh, because it's actually governments that have a big stake in implementation. The third point is uh, that many civil society groups also actively contributed to serve delivery themselves uh, in many areas of uh, the SDG uh, uh, policies. And the last point, uh, that 
what civil society groups have done is especially bottom-up monitoring of uh, uh, of sustainable development goals. Now, how does this play out in different uh, civic spaces from, uh, let's say, from the red close to the to the green open? We've looked at that in a recent study that was published in uh, April this year, and um, we identified um, a, a number of uh, issues there. It was it was focused on six countries, actually representing the whole spectrum. Uh, we looked at Costa Rica, um, we looked at uh, uh, Ghana, uh, Laos, Nepal, Tanzania, but we also included Hungary. And, and the reason we wanted to include these different countries, because there were different sort of levels of freedom of space available for civil society groups, different regions, but also uh, different sort of levels of income. Next slide, please. And I would like to share sort of the main lessons with that. On the top, you see the link to the study, so you can look at it in detail. I want to just share some, some major findings uh, uh, which may help the discussion. So the first point uh, I'd like to highlight. Next, please. Okay. So the, the, the first point uh, that we can, can highlight here is that uh, the civil society groups that we found um, who are involved in formal uh, uh, SDG implementation or, or checking are actually uh, a quite limited group. Um, we see that these are ma mainly the civil society groups that are connected to international donors, uh, globally connected, operating at a national level, uh, generally very urban, and often not that well connected locally. So in our studies in these six countries where we uh, looked at a, two, at a few dozen uh, specific cases, we found actually that at the local uh, level, uh, there's a lack of uh, uh, knowledge and information about what is happening. So those civil society groups involved in um, SDG implementation, sort of monitoring processes, are very particular small group of, you could say, elitist civil society actors. The second lesson was that the implementation uh, of the SDGs is not necessarily leading to an opening of civic space. Um, we saw that uh, uh, the SDGs provide uh, insights about respect for civic freedoms, but it says very little about the actu actual compliance with international civic uh, freedom agreements. We found that CISA, the civil society organizations are more effective in engaging uh, with SDGs when there are open spaces and that closed civic spaces often reflect distrust be between the governments and certain segments of civil society. But civil society space, civic space is reduced. The commitments to SDG 17.17, which is calling for the use of multi-stakeholder partnership is weakening. Yeah? So um, SDG implementation not necessarily is leading to an opening of civic space. The third point is that we see, and I just refer to it, uh, that governments are using a variety of mechanisms to uh, constrain civic space, uh, which is directly undermining uh, SDG 16.10, which calls for the protection of fundamental freedoms. And these, these mechanisms these range from limiting information access, uh, selective inclusion uh, of uh, particular uh, uh, civil society organizations, curtailing foreign funding, uh, or abusing particular government acts, as we, for example, saw in, in Tanzania, uh, to, uh, uh, to realize um, uh, particular constraints on a local uh, NGO. So, and this is increasing during the period of COVID. The fourth point, um, which I thought was quite interesting, uh, even though we saw uh, more and better SDG implementation in situations of open civic space, we also saw that in those open spaces, uh, in this case, a country like Ghana and Costa Rica, there is more um, competition also between civil society groups 
and that competition leads in a way to um, uh, to an undermining actually of their effectiveness uh, often also because they are related to particular political uh, agents and parties um, and um, this uh, undermines in a way their effectiveness so there's a there's another side to the open space uh, as well and the competition of course is in particular for funding and that brings me to my fifth point which is related to the question of uh, the aid system uh, the donor system and obviously this is also one of the themes in in the conference that the sdgs have not brought about any significant change in the way that donors uh, part of the official aid system function towards civil society organizations. So this uh, includes a lack of continuous support, uh, the sustainability question, uh, making CSO engagement in, the, uh, in the, the sustainable development goals quite irregular. We also found that there is increasingly a trend towards less funding. Yeah. Uh, from official donors and increased funding from private donors. And private donors become more and more important in that scene. Next, next slide, please. So this brings me to actually to three points that I would like to bring into the discussion. The first point um, is that uh, a lot of civil society organizations in this whole implementation process are excluded. Yeah. So to deal with that, we should be more conscious of involving more different and more different types uh, of civil society actors uh, into uh, formal SDG processes, especially more uh, from uh, lower levels uh, and not only the national urban levels, but also from more different backgrounds, in, uh, vulnerable groups, indigenous groups, uh, women's groups. Uh, that is sort of a fir first sort of takeaway uh, that I want to highlight. The second point um, is that in some way or another, the subtle constraining of civic space, which is happening currently, has to be countered um, by, first of all, by making clear what is happening. Uh, I, st I started uh, my presentation uh, you saw it with the picture of Hong Kong, which is quite a clear case of constraining civic space, but it also has to be um, taken up by supporting those efforts uh, where the term solidarity, I think is very important to highlight. And the third takeaway I would suggest is to acknowledge that these claimed spaces um, uh, oh, per, per, sorry, that the invited spaces that we have created in the SDG process, and this invited spaces, we mean uh, the spaces where people are asked to put, to sit on the table with others, have to be complemented also by protest groups that I sort of uh, highlighted in the beginning that claim to be on the table as well. So more attention for claimed spaces of those who are excluded uh, and not welcome at the negotiation table. These are the three points I would like to bring uh, into the discussion and in, and, we, and the details we can talk about later on. Thanks, Andre. Thank you very much, Case. That uh, was a very good introduction uh, to our topic. And I'm pretty sure that Martin as a practitioner and with his experience, and I think they are already doing many things that you already mentioned on your presentation. So. Uh, how is Arnica doing that and what is more generally your point on the role of civil society uh, in your field, which is more the kind of like the environmental pillar of uh, sustainable development? Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this to this event. Um, I would like to share some more practical experience and some observations from our work. I represent uh, Arnica NGO from the Czech Republic. Uh, we were established in 2001 and uh, our topics are nature conservation, chemical safety and public participation in decision making on environmental issues. 
And we basically combine campaigning, scientific research and lobbying. And uh, in these three uh, types of work, we also uh, support and cooperate with uh, the, civics, the civil society groups in, in other countries, uh, namely in uh, East Europe, former Soviet Union, Western Balkans. These are our uh, priority areas. Um, when talking about uh, environmental rights uh, and, and foreign policy, we uh, should not uh, forget, I mean, we, uh, especially in the Czech Republic, that uh, we had also uh, the environmental issues were also the one of the priority of the civil society in late uh, um, 80s before the, the Velvet Revolution. Uh, basically, the first large uh, demonstrations uh, in the North uh, Bohemia were organized because of extreme pollution in industrial regions. And they uh, happened even before the, the, uh, the protests of the, of the society against the communist regime. Uh, and uh, you can say that um, uh, also the, the environmental movement was quite powerful and strong and it contributed to the to the whole uh, change of the society later uh, and this is uh, some kind of experience uh, we are also trying to share with, with our partners in, in other countries basically um, our first project that was implemented uh, abroad from the czech republic was in 2010 in armenia with, uh, with the support of uh, uh, european commission uh, maybe we can see some of the pictures from from the countries we work on if if it's possible now to uh to, to screen them from uh, from the folder um and uh, uh, we were working with uh, with the farmers in the countryside basically and our mission was to identify and to discover uh, the storages of old pesticides that were threatening the water and also quality of soil and uh, it was interesting that our partner organization was called women for health and healthy environment so basically it was the ngo of of uh, women that were the leaders of some change and they were promoting a solution of environmental problems in the countryside in a quite traditional society so it was very interesting for us to see that and to have this uh, this organization as, as partners um, since then we have a very similar uh, experience also from from other countries uh, we uh, work uh, quite usually with uh, the communities uh, in the countryside far away from the centers uh, very often we are involving marginalized groups and uh, trying to, to support uh, their demands and, and protect their rights somehow. Uh, and we have the experience that um, environment basically is the issue which is, uh, which is touching everybody. So even the people who are not uh, activists, who are not used to participate in any campaigns, uh, they somehow are touched by environmental issues because that's their daily life, daily experience. And uh, quite frequently, this is the first step for broader engagement of the citizens in, in public affairs also. Um, another example that, that uh, I would like to mention today is um, our experience from Bosnia and Herzegovina, where we started um, to uh, support and build the coalition for rivers in 2017 and um, um, this is a broad coalition of, of civil society organizations from whole country uh, basically the issue of western balkan now is above construction of hydro that might be uh, some environmental alternative for energy production but unfortunately, uh, Balkan is also the place of large natural rivers of Europe. And many of these projects are extremely harmful to, to the environment and they also harm the local communities. Uh, one of the examples we had uh, recently successful cases from, from the last year uh, was the case of uh, village Kruščica, uh, where basically also uh, local women decided to protect the community from harmful projects. And because they were convinced that the construction project is illegal, they started to block the access road to the construction site. Uh, they were blocking the road for several months. Um, after that, the police troop uh, basically came, uh, beaten the woman and detained them. So uh, they were detained for several days, but uh, nevertheless, they came back to the, to the road and continued uh, blocking the, the bridge, basically the access to the construction site uh yeah now we can see some of the pictures um we helped this community uh, to to get lawyers and um, 
we help them to uh, to bring the issue to the court uh, after 500 days of blocking the access roads for day at, day and night basically by their bodies uh, they won the cold case so now it's one of very successful cases so they were able to ch able to challenge the the permissions uh, that were issued illegally uh, now all the permits are cancelled and basically the community saved their river and they are now a big inspiration for similar communities in all western balkans uh, but it, this is not only the case of um, how the local people protected their river and their village uh, these women were also elected in uh, the last elections to the uh, to the local Slav government for the first time in the history because it is very traditional muslim community where women were never elected to to the body so uh, this case also changed a lot the whole uh, structure of the of this community but not only this community basically it, it showed the the women that are obviously more marginalized that they have the power to change the things and um, now they are uh, realizing new new uh, wonderful projects in in that village um in Bosnia, we also had um, quite a big uh, challenge with um, how the society is, is divided uh, because uh, uh, they are the, the areas uh, where live uh, ethnic groups of the Bosnia. So that's uh, Muslim ethnic groups of Bosniaks. Uh, then there is a, a population of Croats and Serbs. And these communities are not used to, uh, to meet each other very often or to talk to each other. They are they basically separated, which is a consequence of the war in, in Bosnia. And now we, uh, we are bringing these uh, people together in the coalition and we can also see a, a big progress, uh, not only cooperation, but also new friendships. And uh, we think that this is a very promising side, uh, sign for the future of the whole country, cooperation of the people across the internal borders, across the, uh, uh, the ethnic borders or, or uh, religious, uh, religious borders. Uh, I would like to mention also uh, our observation from Ukraine, uh, where um, we can see uh, sometimes that the people who are successful as uh, civic activists, and they are well known uh, by the public, by the local community, uh, they are often published in the media, they sometimes decide also to, to step into politics on, on regional or local level. And probably the brightest example is, is Maxim Brodin, the uh, founder of local NGO in Mariupol, which is a town uh, very close to the occupied territories of eastern Ukraine, who after several years of, uh, of very hard work as, uh, as NGO leader became also the city councillor. So now he has a big experience from NGO work. He has a trust of the community. Before the revolution, it was actually very difficult to um, to activate somehow the, the communities in Belarus. People were intimidated, uh, apathetic. They were not really very much interested to talk with, with anybody about anything or to get involved. But environment uh, was um, one of um, quite, uh, let's say, more easy topics, uh, how to uh, even engage the local communities in, in decision-making processes. Uh, so um, we believe that um, supporting local environmental campaigns could also uh, also help to bring uh, some some broader change to the society and it was also uh, more accepted by the state authorities than uh, discussions about anything else so it was not seen uh, as that sensitive issue as uh, as any political issues basically so it was possible to criticize the environmental uh, issues or open the dialogue with the state authorities somehow um, we uh, probably all now uh, are watching the, 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 the situation in Belarus and the violence of the state against the citizens, but we as environmental NGO also can see uh, a specific uh, persecution of environmental activists uh, who were previously uh, involved in uh, anti-nuclear campaign, especially because Belarus uh, is about to launch a new nuclear power plant in uh, this November, which is a project uh, which is not uh, probably well known internationally. Uh, but uh, the, the civic campaign against the nuclear power plant was the largest uh, public campaign uh, within the last decade, probably. And now uh, we can see that, uh, that the state um, uh, like together with the general persecutions of the people demonstrating against the regime is, is also persecuting uh, especially environmental activists who were 
who were quite successful in mobilization of the communities uh, communities before. Uh, as it was mentioned, uh, the, the COVID pandemic uh, is bringing new challenges, um, the case in, from the region, from Europe, uh, Balkan states and the former Soviet Union countries, uh, where the governments or also private corporations misused the uh, the pandemic situation uh, for uh, enforcing controversial projects or also controversial legislation, which is basically uh, deteriorating the, uh, the the possibility of the of the uh, citizens to participate in decision making, and um, this is happening throughout all region. And unfortunately, we will probably be witnessing uh, more cases of of. of uh, uh, of similar and similar nature, unfortunately. Uh, so, yeah, basically, the civil society organizations need uh, even more support now than uh, than any time uh, before, because the situation is is more uh, critical and and more difficult for for them now. Uh, to to conclude. Uh, uh, I see, and uh, from uh, experience of my organizations, uh, organization, I can say that uh, it's it's crucial to to keep supporting civil society organizations because they uh, very often represent the um, uh, the public interests and also the the interests of local communities. Uh, and um, the technical assistance that is usually provided by the EU international donors and intergovernmental organization organizations uh, is usually not enough because uh, uh, it uh, usually goes to the to the state authorities to the governments but it's it doesn't always contribute to uh, uh, let's say a larger space for the civil society or larger uh, environmental democracy in, in these countries uh, it's it's very important also to uh, see the needs and um, situation of the communities that live far away from the centers rural communities communities uh yeah somewhere in the somewhere out of big cities because these are usually more affected by environmental issues and they have also more complicated access to any type of help or support uh, we can also often see that especially women are very often leaders of the change, especially on local level. Uh, and if they get some support and uh, and some, um, uh, yeah, basically some support, they can really organize the communities and, and uh, be very effective in, in uh, protecting their rights. Um, as the situation now in Eastern partnership countries is, is unstable, also the, the support scheme must be quite flexible. We can see it basically uh, now uh, that we need to change our plans very frequently because the situation is changing and our plans collapse for different reasons. So also the types of support of the of the civil society must uh, must be must be flexible. Um, and uh, the last point, um, we see that uh, environmental concerns are more and more important for the general citizens of, of the countries in the east. Uh, it's maybe related to the fact that um, the environmental uh, crisis uh, or environmental issues are touching the people more. It's more visible. The problems are probably um, getting worse. So people are more touched by that. And we can see uh, increasing interest of the people in being active and participating somehow in, in, in searching for solutions. Uh, and especially Czech Republic has, has some uh, experience that we can share, not only technical, but also the experience that I mentioned at the beginning, that environmental movement can really contribute to uh, the general change in the society. So so that's, uh, that's all from me for now, and uh, I'd be happy to uh, discuss the things later. Thank you very much, Martin, for your presentation. You raised so many points. I think we can return to many. But I would just like our uh, one topic that you, that you, I think, goes together with your presentation and you have practical examples of how important it is for uh, women that uh, help each other to empower, to uh, have a spillover into politics. And also, uh, you mentioned the role of a rural community that are more impacted by envir environmental factors. 
and um, having less infrastructure, having less opportunities to raise their their voice. I would like uh, I would like case. Do you have you mentioned uh, actually the uh, at more say theoretical level the need for including more marginalized communities into uh, decision making in the civil space? Um, in your research, do you have any ideas about how to do that? I mean, what are the practical recipes to, to include the communities that are, were voiceless or that were not heard that well? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Martin. Thanks, Andre, yeah, for the question. I think uh, I very much agree with, with Martin that um, indeed, um, at at rural levels um there is often sort of less attention and that is very important because but on, not only a rural also community level um the levels that are sort of less visible and that includes also those uh, uh those sort of spaces where for example indigenous groups uh lgbt activists uh are, are active they're less visible but that's where the change happens martin was referring to often uh, women uh, stand in front uh, when it when it is about sort of local social change. I think that's that's very important. So your question, how can we um, uh, make that happen, or how can we support that or facilitate that, is by um, acknowledging uh, that we often don't see that. It's because we we have a particular lens in which we don't see uh, where actually the the change makers are, and um, I think I think that is uh, a way of um, a way to go about it. Is um, basically well, very practical and, uh, to 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 get out of your hotels in the in the in the capitals and uh, and and look further, uh, but also be 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 sensitive to those groups that, for example, are not. Uh, connected to internet uh, because we don't know them because they're not connected. Um, so we have to sort of look critically at ourselves um, how small often our world is, and uh, and in a way I think that's that's the interesting interesting thing about the the pandemic. Um, the world is closing for many, but the paradox is actually that the world is also becoming bigger. Uh, I was in a workshop last week where we suddenly managed to get people from uh, 25 different countries of the global south together because we were able to connect worldwide. The only thing we had to do is we had to take a time slot in the middle of the day so that everyone sort of would be able to connect. And I think that's maybe one way of doing it. We have to facilitate inclusion uh, also in times of, uh, of the pandemic. Well, thank you very much. I think that's also an inspiration for the next time to make more inclusive panels. It was not our intention to have three um, more or less middle-aged men on the, on the, on the panel. Uh, but uh, yeah, we had some... some Can last I say one more thing, Andre? Uh, is you're saying um, white male panels. It's not only that. We're also of a particular generation. Um, I think one of the groups that we really have to involve is a younger generation. Uh, and they often sort of are not sitting at the table. They are not sort of the, the ones who, who receive support. Uh, but they are making the change at this moment. Uh, I think in the environmental movement that Martin sort of refers to, I've seen an enormous commitment uh, of a younger generation which is not uh, which is stopped suddenly also by the pandemic, um, which I think should be acknowledged. And um, uh, they are making the, the, the tomorrow's world, and we have to have more attention for them. So it's not only a uh, white man uh, that sort of uh, dominates that, it's also all the white men. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think that's a good inspiration to next time or to think out of the box also about inviting people to panel this. Uh, and then you said there were also like technical access to internet and so on that makes that complicated. But that also leads me to a question. Uh, I think that was very interesting because uh, we now have, uh, especially uh, in the Czech Republic, we have uh, Belarus, what happens there, very high on the agenda as a, as a foreign affairs issue. 
And I was a bit surprised because, for instance, I never heard about the plan to uh, to build or renovate a new coal power plant in, in Belarus and about the opposition and about uh, the arrests of the environmental activists. And I think that's also maybe a role of the media that when we talk about the more general issues about having a clear uh, villain, the dictator, and uh, the streets that are full, that are like visible, especially in the capital. And then there are, yes, there are issues that happen maybe more uh, away from the uh, from these pops of the reporters. Uh, Martin, do you have any particular observation? Because I think your activities, you know about how it's reported in, in the media. Do you have anything uh, to, to say about their role and what could also be improved on the that side so that people get information because I think this is also key and uh, another topic maybe related. We are talking about media and I thought about traditional media but are uh, uh, in practice and for environmental rights, uh, do social media help or is their role overrated? Uh, well, it, it very much depends on the country actually. In, in Belarus, obviously there is a, a very difficult access to uh, to any free media but people still use social networks so uh, it's it's quite helpful uh, we can also see uh, something similar in other other countries we, we work in that um, when the media are not informing truly or not sufficiently then uh, then people um, usually use uh, social networks for informing each other. So it's quite powerful and it's also something that needs to be supported. Uh, free media and and also alternative sources of information because it, it helps the, the local people especially to, to to get connected somehow and it can it can bring some change. So, so definitely yes. And uh, yeah, concerning the fact that we do not know much about uh, some of the things that are going on in Belarus, for example, that nuclear power plant that I mentioned, that's just related by the fact that there is just so many things going on and probably these things are not seen as that important maybe. So yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, but I think that's good that you also are mentioned the kind of the positive examples of our spillover just from the kind of environmental activism toward towards uh, project activities, which I think this kind of like positive um, part of the, of the news. We now have also a, a first question from, from the public asked for, by our, our former colleague at the IRR and now our associate professor at, uh, at the Charles University of Vladimir Handel. If you could, uh, and I think it's a question that goes to both of you, on if you could elaborate on the strategy how to make cooperation at the level of the civil society sustainable in such antagonistic or uh, um, political environment, and the dimensions Belarus or, or Russia. I think that goes more into deep about the practical strategies, and I hope there are also some policymakers or or, or funders or who um, or. Um, funding those uh, tools to help civil society. If you go, or both of you go into more more detail on those uh, strategies, especially in environments that are not very open for the civil society. Um, Case, do you want to start, please? Uh, no, let Martin start, because you refer to Belarus and and, uh, and, and maybe okay, I can yeah. build on that. Okay, if there part is of an for you to them, that would be great, yeah. Uh, okay, then I will, I will try to say something. Uh, I do not really know how to work in Russia because uh, we never even tried. I think it's it's specific case and it's it's more difficult for anybody uh, from abroad to do anything in Russia. So, so I cannot say anything about that. But in Belarus, uh, before the revolution, it was it was still quite possible because, as I said, uh, environmental issues were not seen by the government as um, too controversial. Uh, so it was still possible to um, speak relatively publicly about environmental issues. And uh, we were basically building some network of activists and uh, local communities throughout the, uh, the industrial cities that are affected by pollution and heavy industry. And uh, we were building some communication channels between these groups. So basically it was a uh, relatively closed network 
of the people who are already aware of the issues and that uh, wanted to do something about that. And we were working with these people. It means like providing them trainings, providing them uh, some expert support, some 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 consultancy of how to work, legal support, and so on. So this is basically the uh, our like first step so we are trying to identify the people who are already aware of the things we support them and uh, they slowly build uh, some local network around them so basically the the amount of the people who are involved in, in the activities is somehow growing so this was our uh, modus operandi in belarus and i think it's possible to uh, to work a similar way in in most of the countries where the situation is um, let's say more difficult or it's not very welcoming for uh, civil society activists mm -hmm. well very interesting i also uh from our research at the irr i mean that and or more specifically also from from an evaluation of the czech transition program in uh, in georgia we get the Kind of like I think that the main uh, takeaway was that uh, it's also very difficult actually to support those sustainable networks with annual projects because you have just project planning for one year, you have to come up with outputs while or creating or supporting those networks is also something that lasts uh, longer. But I think there were also some uh, reflection on the side of the Czech Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and they now somehow uh, support also like multi-annual projects so that would be maybe also a kind of practical uh, practical recommendation on the long-term uh, strategy for uh, sustaining the civil society networks. Um, but also, can, can, can I, case, yeah. you... yes, I would like to sort of add to that. Um, I mean, first of all, I think Martin was already re referring to it. Uh, uh, I mean, if we look, if we look at change um, in societies and, and major sort of political change, you will always be able to refer it back to a group of citizens that sat together and sort of discussed how can we sort of make change and uh, through coalitions and mobilizations. Uh, in other words, uh, virtually all social change is coming. Uh, it is originating in civil society. I think that's a very important uh, thing to establish uh, whilst saying it is important to keep uh, civil societies uh, strong and to make sure that, that groups that are excluded are supported. Now, the problem is that uh, whilst when you start supporting and especially financing groups in civil society, uh, it always tends to undermine them as well uh, because there's a certain expectation and that's where wherever you look in the world it happens um, it's it also generates an orientation towards donors uh, uh, with which the donors eventually are also unhappy I mean ask any donor and the worst thing that can happen uh, is that uh, they become, uh, let's say, addicted to your support because that's not why you supported them. And I think there is a dilemma to solve. There's other ways than supporting uh, uh, civil society groups than with money or projects. It can also be done in creating uh, coalitions, inviting them into discussions, um, Facilitating broader sort of uh, um, enabling environments, I think, is is very important. Uh, you talked about the press. I think it's extremely important that um, in countries where where freedom of expression is curtailed, you know, that that is stopped because that is such an essential uh, part also of civic action. So um, the, the the point I want to make here, it is not a matter of only. Uh, putting money uh, into the civic civil society pot, yeah, uh, and that can actually undermine it. Uh, there's, there's there's lots of examples of that. Um, often, what's happening is then that civil society groups are, become disconnected uh, from their base and from their sort of constituencies, which is not what you want. You want you want actually that they become better rooted and and more empowered. So uh, that's sort of the, 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 the concern, and there's not no one-way solution. So as I understand the question, how, how to make it sustainable, 
well, sustainable means that you do not only rely on financial support, but also uh, it's also capacity building. It's also facilitating connections, uh, facilitating media outlets and that type of thing. So it's multifaceted. That has to be uh, established because with only money, you create dependencies, you create disempowerment, um, and you probably also often as I said earlier, support the wrong groups because you don't know the ones that you actually would like to support because they're not visible. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Thank you. Now, perhaps looking more into the future, I think there was a very interesting point in Martin's presentation on, uh, on Bosnia and Herzegovina mentioning this kind of like clash between say maybe also like climate or uh, social economic development concerns with a solution to build new dams on uh, on rivers and at the same time which may be also accommodating for uh, for climate concerns with clean energy and on the other hand the the say general environmental protection and uh, most probably i don't want to be a, a pessimist but i expect there will be more and more of those conflicts between uh, different strains of the different pillars of, uh, of a sustainable development where uh, social and environmental concerns can actually clash. And uh, we also have uh, very concrete examples from our regions when we look at the co-regions in, the, in, the, in the North Bohemia, East uh, Moravian Silesia, and also from the Polish side, uh, side of the borders. So my question to both of you, and I'm afraid that would be the last question uh, on this panel, is uh, how to, uh, well, I'm sure there are no silver bullets, but uh, those kind of like conflicts between different parts of what development uh, should be for different groups and the environmental and social concerns. Do you see, do you have any uh, like positive example on how civil society can can help can assist to to their more say peaceful solution and reconciliation of different interests and uh, values in societies um martin if you want to start since you uh, yeah. mentioned already yeah okay. the case okay. I, I can yeah i can maybe maybe elaborate more on that bosnian case because the the original idea because Bosnia now is quite dependent on coal energy, which is obviously dirty. And the, the original idea was that there will be hydropower plants that will replace some of the maybe coal uh, power plants, but it's not happening. Now Bosnia is basically exporting energy, both from thermal and hydropower plants. Uh, plus also the people who invented the idea of hydro energy didn't consider the fact that um, there is a basically uh, no nature protection tools because the nature protection that uh, was uh, in place in ex Yugoslavia is not existing anymore and uh, nothing replaced it. So it very much depends on the place. And obviously if there are no uh, strict rules, then uh, these, uh, these conflicts can happen. And uh, in Bosnia, I think that uh, this coalition for rivers can now uh, really bring um, a new light to that because we are trying to uh, to help to define the uh, the rules the clear rules how uh, these power plants uh, should or should not be constructed and at, at which locations so we we do not want to say that no hydropower plant should be uh, should be built uh, but we also cannot uh, just give the space to the to the investors to build them um, anywhere Okay, thank you, Raj Martin. Uh, Case? Um, okay, so I think um, the, um, the, the, the question is how we can um, sort of look uh, uh, in terms of perspective, how can civil society uh, organization uh, also assist in, in, in sort of peace, as you say, peaceful solutions? I was involved in, um, in a recent sort of initiative by uh, um, 170 academics in, in the Netherlands that uh, argued that it is uh, that we have to use the current situation of uh, COVID to uh, um, actually make dramatic changes. And that has, uh, has had an enormous resonance uh, amongst uh, civil society groups, but also media. 
Uh, and basically, uh, the, the point was that we said uh, COVID-19 has had such a, uh, a major e economic impact, uh, mostly because the whole economic development uh, model that has been uh, dominant over the last 30 years uh, is, is, should be changed. And we should use actually the COVID moment also to make those changes. And we made proposals about uh, circular uh, agriculture, about reducing uh, consumption, reducing travel. I think this is already a very positive. I mean, we are forced to reduce travel. We couldn't travel to Prague, <laughs> uh, for example. But I think it also makes us think uh, how, uh, what we have here, actually, what model we're in, what process we are in. And there, I think civil society groups have proposed a lot of ideas also about uh, redistribution of resources, uh, who's most affected uh, currently uh, by, uh, let's say, the measures uh, to to contain uh, the pandemic, um, but also debt reduction. I think there's a, a few very interesting proposals on the table um, that are inspiring. And I think the other thing, and you asked about very concrete actions, um, I referred to it earlier in my presentation. Uh, we see that there is a lot of solidarity going on uh, as a result of uh, people that have been affected but don't have access to uh, health resources worldwide. Uh, there is a lot of solidarity at local level going on to deal with the problem. And I think that is an insp inspiring way um, to see that where governments are unable to act, people are able to start uh, organizing themselves and help each other. So um, I think we should sort of uh, learn a lot of lessons. Uh, what is happening if a crisis like the one that we are sort of currently experiencing uh, is, is coming up, but also what opportunities it offers us to, to make change? Maybe that's a big answer to, <laughs> to your question, but we can discuss it more probably. <laughs> that's, a big, that's a big answer. I would find it also is last word on, the, on this panel and I'm really happy it's positive because I think that the idea of the current wave of solidarity also for thinking about new ways of improving participation in a new environments, be it online because we cannot meet physically, that's a, that's a big challenge or also for us as uh, those who organize this type of, of, uh, of you know, events as well as for civil society. That is also, I think, Martin, a bit disconnected. You cannot travel to to talk to your partners uh, directly. So let's hope that this uh, uh, solidarity will go beyond the accessibility of the vaccine. And uh, and that's all for this panel. Thank you so much for your very inspiring uh, ideas and contributions. We also the have a uh, publication or uh, the the magazine was now in Politica. So I would try to somehow to summarize your ideas and also to put them on the paper, at least starting in, in check so that we have come some, some kind of uh, follow-up beyond this, uh, this uh, great, small, but uh, very inspiring panel. Thank you very much, Case. Um, goodbye to, to The Hague. Uh, thank you very much, yeah. Martin, for your, for your also great pictures. I think that they, that added some of the visualization to uh, kind of like feel about uh, about when we talk about civil society thank you very much and uh, you can we can be back for within eight minutes for the for the closing session of the host Coca conference again thank you very much for being you on the panel and those who have been here uh with us uh, and uh, following us our debate good afternoon bye